Child's Play emerged as a groundbreaking horror film that captured the imagination of audiences worldwide. Directed by Tom Holland and written by Don Mancini, with rewrites by Holland and John Lafia, the movie introduced us to the menacing realm of a killer good guy doll named Chucky. The storyline revolves around Andy Barkley, a young boy who receives a seemingly harmless good guy doll for his birthday, only to discover that it houses the malevolent spirit of a serial killer, Charles Lee Ray. What follows is a bone-chilling game of cat and mouse, as Chucky, now alive and on a quest to possess Andy's body, unleashes chaos and terrorizes those around him. On paper, it could have stacked up amongst the rest of the cheesy 80s fare that could have only been remembered by die-hard Full Moon fanatics. In fact, Charles Band even expressed interest in filming the script after producing Cellar Dweller, which Mancini wrote. After deeming the project too expensive, he passed on it. Heck, at first a bunch of studios passed on the project. But then it got into the hands of an American tale producer, David Kirshner. With his ties to Steven Spielberg, studios finally became interested, which led to United Artists winning a bidding war. It's all about who you know, folks. Following its release, Child's Play quickly became a cultural phenomenon, birthing a franchise that spanned multiple sequels, a reboot, and a fantastic TV series. Don't fuck with the Chuck! Central to the franchise's success is the character of Chucky himself, who has evolved into one of the most iconic figures in horror cinema. Chucky's enduring appeal lies in his unique blend of terror and personality. Unlike other silent killers, Chucky is vocal, cunning, and possesses a dark sense of humor, making him both terrifying and strangely charismatic. I love these things. What's your name, buddy? Chucky. Brad Dourif's performance as the voice of Chucky brought the character to life in a way that resonated with audiences, elevating him to the ranks of horror legends like Freddy Krueger and Jason Voorhees. Moreover, Chucky's ability to adapt to changing times has kept him relevant in an ever-evolving horror landscape. While the original Child's Play tapped into fears surrounding consumerism and innocence in the 1980s, subsequent entries in the franchise have explored themes ranging from technology to parenthood, ensuring that Chucky remains a formidable force of horror no matter the generation. We use the term masterpiece often when discussing films that we love, maybe sometimes too often. However, one of the many reasons why Child's Play stands as a masterpiece of horror is its exceptional cast, whose performances elevate the film to new heights of terror and intrigue. Led by talented actors who fully embrace their roles, the cast brings depth, nuance, and authenticity to the characters, making them memorable and compelling figures in the annals of horror cinema. At the heart of the film is Alex Vincent, who delivers a captivating performance as Andy Barkley, the young boy at the center of the chaos. With his wide-eyed innocence and vulnerability, Vincent portrays Andy as a sympathetic protagonist thrust into a nightmarish world beyond his comprehension. As Andy grapples with the horrors unleashed by Chucky, Vincent imbues the character with a sense of courage and determination that makes him a relatable and admirable hero. And he does all of this at the age of six years old. Opposite Vincent is Catherine Hicks, who shines as Karen Barkley, Andy's devoted mother. Hicks brings warmth and strength to the role, imbuing Karen with a fierce maternal instinct and, and unwavering love for her son. As Karen confronts the terrifying truth about Chucky's origins, Hicks delivers a powerful performance filled with conviction and determination, cementing her character as a formidable force against the forces of evil. Just take a look at the scene when she finally realizes that her little boy isn't imagining things. When Chucky spins his head around when she notices that he's been active without batteries is truly some nightmarish stuff. In addition to the main cast, this features a supporting ensemble of talented actors who each contribute to the film's overall impact. After working with him on Fright Night, Holland brought in Chris Sarandon to play Detective Mike Norris, the skeptical cop drawn into the supernatural mystery, as he does with pretty much everything he's been in. From the moment Detective Norris is introduced, Sarandon simply owns the screen with his commanding presence and steely resolve. 
But really, this film and series wouldn't be what it is without Brad Dourif. Even though we physically see him in the opening moments of the film, Dourif's voice sets the tone for Chucky's character, conveying a sense of malice and menace that sends shivers down the spine. No matter what! Actually, one of my favorite moments of his, other than his hide your soul bit, is just a throwaway scene involving him in an elevator with an older couple. Ugly doll. Fuck you. Although Dorif is the voice of the entire franchise, the true MVP is the doll's designer, Kevin Yeager. Following his works on the previous Elm Street sequels, Kevin and his team of puppeteers brought Chucky to life using various state-of-the-art animatronics, cosmetics, and even actors using forced perspective, one including Alex Vincent's little sister. Seeing the doll transform throughout the film from an innocent toy to a more human element with a receding hairline is brilliant. The use of that good old practical effects magic that we constantly rave about is one of the many reasons why this film still holds up to this day. Just like the Elm Street films, the first entry plays strictly as horror. As the series continues, though, so did the comedy. But what sets this series apart from that of Kruger is that Chucky never becomes a caricature of himself. We eagerly await what he will say and do next, because he's simply an asshole. I'll bite a pretty funny one. I don't know whether to kill him or just take notes. <laughs> In a world of Hellraisers, Halloweens, Elm Streets, and Friday the 13th, Child's Play remains my favorite horror franchise. Don Mancini stuck with it and kept its plotline going after all these years, keeping it fresh and never going stale. There can be some debate, but in my opinion, there's not a dud in the group. Even Seed of Chucky is schlocky fun that feels like an homage to John Waters' trash cinema. As the circle of life does its thing, my own son had fears of Chucky. He even covered his eyes when he popped up briefly in Ready Player One. Child's Play is more than just a horror movie. It's a timeless classic that continues to captivate audiences decades after its release. From its memorable characters to its thought-provoking themes, this film has earned its place in the pantheon of horror greatness. And because of this, Chucky indeed will always remain a friend till the end. I'm Chucky. Wanna play? When it comes to iconic genre sequels, we pretty much all agree on the greats. And though this has always been loved by fans, I'd argue Child's Play 2 rivals the first. And that the popularization of Rotten Tomatoes is just f up what I assumed we all agreed upon. Taking the wise move of expanding mythology, going bigger and meaner, yet retaining the threat in an idyllic and grounded, or you know, best you can with a killer doll, suburban setting. As we start the month of Halloween, I'd like to explore why this sequel still stands strong. A few key moments, and of course, the scene that defines it. Spoilers, it's the Toy Factory scene. I'm Lance Velchek, and this is Scene Breakdown. Remake aside, the Child's Play franchise has, to date, seven movies and three seasons of television. Now with the third season being its last, it could be a while before we see our favorite Lakeshore Strangler return. But <laughs> make no mistake, he'll be back. And that's what I've always respected about this franchise, its ebbs and flows. Adapting when need be and always swinging for the fences. Now, does it all work? No, oh, no. But Don Mancini has done the impossible. Kept the same story, the same timeline traversing ahead. No ignored sequels, no timeline changes, no Corey Cunningham. Okay, I got admit that was humorous. Which brings me to the first sequel. And listen, but before we get to what's my take on the defining scene, I just want to talk on why this works so damn well. Co-writer of the original, John Lafia, was brought in to direct, and Mancini came back as the sole writer. 
Now, word in the street says it's because some of the ideas and you know the character of Chucky himself weren't really up to par on the original, and uh, you know he wanted to put the wrong things right. Lafia, along with cinematographer Stefan Sapsky, gives this sequel such a fresh and distinctive look. Let's talk about how this vibrant look plays with the expectation of uneasiness. Lafia wanted things to feel like they were from the perspective of a child. And as Andy took the full lead, what would the world look like through his perspective? Now we have lower camera angles, the reds and blues pop. I mean, even the night scenes are stylishly bright. There's this uh, embellished, almost old Hollywood look here. I mean, the big toy factory set piece is electric, filled with yellows and greens, and fully lit as a factory should be. This whole movie pops. It's how to continue what came before, but this changed the look and feel without losing its authenticity and respect for part one. I mean, the one scene I almost picked because, I mean, let's be honest, it's iconic in the franchise. And if you were a kid like me when this came out, creeped you the f out. The one with Miss Kettlewell. I mean, Beth Grant really is good at selling this uptight crotchety type. This. <laughs> I mean, Child's Play 3 is probably the balance of humor and uh, horror that the franchise has been pivoting to and from. I mean, obviously, Bride and Seed go more funny. But my money has always been on the tone of the sequel. This is peak Chucky. <laughs> this is such a dick move. But, you know, the man needs a body and is playing the field any way he can. This classroom feels both real yet bizarre colorful and inviting it, something's off. And it's most of the movie. I mean, the use of wide-angle lenses distort everything to where there's always a slight unease, even if it's just Chucky looking through papers. Andy being locked in that room, in a school with other faculty, in the late afternoon, yet his life is still in danger. I mean, it's a ballsy move that could have come off comical, yet it's a standout in the movie. Sure, sure. I mean, listen, a death by yardstick is far-fetched. But the vivid colors, you know, upgraded and fantastic effects by Jaeger and team, makes it one of the few things that should come to mind when somebody talks Chucky. And listen, the cast really sells it with everyone turning in something great and fun. I mean, Alex Vincent returns and is fantastic. He's older, you know, his acting's matured. He's, he's a great lead. An American world from London's Jenny Agater comes off as genuine and paternal as Joanna. You know, I guess she has disowned this or, I don't know, looks unfavorably upon it since a ton of her scenes were cut, though supposedly the version that aired on TV added some of those back in. Uh, but again, for limited screen time, she's great. Like I feel for her, she has a presence. Garrett Graham plays a douchebag foster dad so well, you actively root for his death. How's it hanging, Phil? Ah! And listen, if I'm being honest, He'll always be the great Dr. Pankow to me. Informing young minds. But the best addition, and one I'm still kind of heartbroken wasn't rectified till, honestly, very recently, was Christina Lisa's addition of Kyle. A cool, sassy teen who smokes, sneaks out at night, and is still a decent human being. I mean, we're coming off a lot of uh, worn tropes of the 80s, and I'm surprised this works so well. I mean, shit, outside of Ash vs. Evil Dead, this is one of the few times giving the lead a sidekick integrates so well. The character being older but still a kid helps bring the gap of Andy's world and that of the ignorant adults. She's the big sister he never had, and an ending with her and Andy in the factory uh, gives the finale more weight. But it's here where Child's Play 2 cements itself as one of the greatest sequels, and the Chucky we've come to know and love cackle and all. The Toy Factory final act is brilliant because on paper it's a basic chase, cat and mouse scene. Lafia's direction along with Sapsky's lighting and lenses. Now, it probably wouldn't be fair to call this entire ending a scene, though it is the best ending Chucky's had and a series high. But specifically where he realizes that it's already too late. Charles waited too long and just loses it. Brad Dorf gives his best, I said it, his best and most intense version of Charles Lee Ray right here. And let's be honest, this is the best Chucky has ever looked. Doing away with the human brows, which you know I, I did like in the first, but gives this doll more of a soulless look. The dirty teeth and gums, and those giant sky blue eyes. 
It's a better upgrade all around, and with Dorif's emotive performance, even now, he's just not quite there. We get a great low angle chase through the mountain of good guy dolls, just bright yellows at every corner, and a cool nod to The Shining. It's a fun chase and from a visual standpoint does a lot with something as simple as toy boxes. It's tense and needing to climb the drop roller is genius. Does anybody remember Discovery Zone? Shit, am I dating myself? Well, they had this exact thing. You'd slide down, have a good time, sometimes you'd pinch your fingers, you'd go back up and try it again. And as a kid, this scene just hit different because I know how hard it would be to climb up this thing with little to no upper body strength. A nice tense moment knowing the killer doll is on its way. And if you mess up, you go all the way back to the bottom. But it's Chucky chasing Andy up with the knife, screaming, where he becomes a horror staple. He needs to rip his own hand off just to escape. Fully human inside the doll, the effects are gory and gross, and you could just feel the pain as it stretches. And then Chucky gives himself a knife hand. This, this culminates Mancini, directed by Lafia, making Chucky an all-time great. It's both appropriate, cool, and filmically iconic. <laughs> Stating the obvious, I hate kids. A killer doll willing to get what needs to be done by any means necessary. This put him next to the greats on the Mount Rushmore of horror. Child's Play 2 is a masterful sequel that surpasses the original in almost every way. I, I know, listen, the original's a classic, but it needs to be said. Wisely building upon the mythology and expertly balancing tension and humor. Child's Play 3. I am a lover of the 90s and would like to discuss the first entry to stall the series. So let's get into Chucky Goes to Military School with Child's Play 3. Released in near nine months after part two, we time jump eight years as Andy Barkley, now played by Jimmy Olsen himself, Justin Whalen. What? No Lois and Clark fans? Am I showing my age? Cheesy for sure, but TNT had two things going on for a small kid. Adventures of Superman reruns, and the fact that Tremors was played every single week for, I don't know, like my entire childhood. Like, get your shit together, sci-fi. Fuck you! We want you back, Val. We want you back. Barkley is all grown up. Andy, how you've grown. And in this new future of 1998, that happens to look a lot like 91. His mom has now been institutionalized. While the failures of the foster care system has put him into the Kent Military Academy. The one thing about part three that has gotten better over the years is the school setting. As a kid, I always felt this was too confined. Part one took place around Chicago. The sequel is set in Pasadena, masquerading as the Chicagoland area. Yeah, this doesn't look like any burb around here. The jump from a metropolis to a centralized, almost claustrophobic school was pretty underwhelming. Now I can see it in a better light. With Curse set mostly in a house and Colt in an insane asylum, I can appreciate Kent a bit more. Pretty quickly after his arrival, the boss man Cochran tosses Chucky in a dumpster, prompting one of the best and most bizarre kills in the entire series. Let's discuss. As a kid too young to probably watch this, seeing the inside of a garbage truck kill this poor guy always stuck with me. Who would have thought that inside every garbage truck is a spinning spiked death wheel that would have been more in line with something from the Goblin King? You remind me of the babe. Oh, the babe with the power, if I had to guess. But back to the task at hand. That was a childhood lie, and something that is so outlandish now that I can't help but love it. Our main human antagonist, Lieutenant Colonel Brett Shelton, is played by the scene-stealing Travis Fine, in a role best described as the guy you'd most likely want to punch in the f***ing face. Who said you could look at me? Do you know who I am? That's a compliment, as his whole purpose is to thwart Andy, and does a damn fine job at it. This was the first time we really got a human roadblock outside of Chucky himself. The foster dad didn't count. Of course, the best character who fits this description in this series is the amazing Chief Warren Kincaid, played by the threesome-loving and always great John Ritter. Since this is a strict macho environment and is dominated by rules and regulation, I enjoy how confined Andy is. Not only is he basically considered a loon, 
It's time to forget these fantasies of killer dolls. But he can't even fight for his life without causing trouble. And then we got Larry over here, spending the entire film trying to cut everyone's hair. And let's call this out. This man is a low-key fetish for this. Yes. Oh, yes. He is way too into this for what must be a low-level job. You know, the Romans invented the military cut. Why? Keep their hair short so the enemies couldn't grab a hold of it in battle and slit their throat. I guess this is what kept Lucius Verinus and Titus Polo safe. Uh, not you. Gaius Julius Caesar. <laughs> shit. All of this outside stress added on to the fact that this is the third time a killer doll has showed up in his life looking for trouble. They hinted a bit of PTSD in regards to Andy, but never delve into it enough outside of surface level. Andy at this point should have been a mess. Suicidal, drug addled, he looks way too healthy and attractive for losing everything. Me, at his exact age, with his exact problems. I'd look more like this. Taking over for Tom Holland and John Lafia. Lafia? Lafia? We get director Jack Bender's first theatrical release. More of a director for the small screen, Jack has done some of the best episodes from some of the best shows. He has a lot of goodwill behind him. The low angle shot of Chucky reloading the paint guns with real bullets is perfect. Load, lock. Load, lock. This still creeps me out. And that close-up. Beautiful. Let's not forget that these kids had no protective gear. So regardless of Chucky's tampering, someone was losing an eye. Man, 90s military school was tough. The carnival ending set piece is great. Bright colors, cinematic lighting, and the hellscape ride that the final battle takes place in is worth the movie alone. Now let's forget that this carnival takes place in the middle of nowhere, with not a single lit road leading to it. Eh, forget about that, it's all good. This should have been a bigger part of the movie. Chucky would have had a better time blending in and could have compromised some rides. Panic, people flying off rides, kids getting trampled. Ah, <sighs> a big miss. Chucky getting half of his face swiped off is one of the best visuals in the entire series as he falls into the fan via slow motion, shows how good Jack Bender is at his job. The one thing that surprises me is that this was where the tonal shift in Chucky happened. Yet Bride gets the credit for it. Bride of Chucky was more of a comedic movie, yes, but the Chucky we all know and love today was born in part three. He's more self-aware more sarcastic and heavy with the quips. Tampering with the mail is a federal offense. Chucky's gonna be a bro. This means war. Nothing like his strangulation to get the circulation going. The pairing of him and Jeremy Silver's character Tyler is damn near comical. <laughs> Who the fuck are you? <laughs> is, is Tyler supposed to be this fucking stupid? Young Andy Barkley was innocent as well. But at least he was six years old at the time. This is confirmed by his lack of toasting abilities and his laughable milk to cereal ratio. <laughs> what a fool. Tyler is eight years old. I'm surprised he hasn't already gotten into a strange van with the promise of candy. Wise up. Though the stories are superior in Curse and Cult, Chucky's attitude leans closer to this than to the first two films. And I'm okay with that. Let's just give this a bit more credit. Presto, you dead. For giving Chucky the heavy, sarcastic wit we all know and love. And yes, it's not that this wasn't there before, but it's now been unleashed. The production was rushed, which led to most of Child's Play 3's problems. Mancini and Dorf both cite this as their least favorite. Interesting. Child's Play 3 is an odd spelling and pronunciation for C to Chucky. But I digress. Though there's a lot to like, this is clearly the worst out of the original trilogy. Tyler is a terrible character. And Silvers is an asset in real life as well. Though I like Jimmy Olsen as Barkley, they really missed the chance to expand on his PTSD and childhood trauma. With the different directions and journeys Chucky has been on, this stands as an odd, interesting little entry. A simpler time that 
accidental or not, rounded out Chucky as more of a wittier, playful killer doll. This also happens to be the last time we saw the classic Chucky look. Now, I don't hate the new look. I don't love it either. And the battle damage style was interesting. This. This will always be creepier to me. So when people complain or type loudly on the internet that Child's Play 3 is the worst, I think of the words from the kind and gentle soul of Chicago's own Charles Lee Ray. Gotta be fucking kidding me. And I'm your friend to the end. Heidi ho Ha ha ha. Chucky had his solo adventures for three movies before this entry in the franchise, and in 1998, it was time to revive the franchise and give him a friend, a lover, a being just as twisted and violent as he is. Thus was created his bride, the one and only Tiffany Valentine. Her obsession with Chucky, predating the films, going back all the way to before Charles Lee Ray died and had his soul trapped in a doll, a woman who loved him more than she probably should have. This setup is one meant to create something entirely new, yet familiar in the Child's Play films, bringing them to the forefront and making them a bunch of money. The film was a mild financial success and a mitigated as best critical success. How did the team behind Bride of Chucky make this entry in Charles Lee Ray's adventures? Well, as a fourth in the series, a lot of elements had been established which should have been followed or not. This here is dark, filled with truly messed up humor at times, with a pretty big cast and some bloody kills. The film takes our anti-hero and brings him into the pre-Y2K era with more humor than fans were used to from his films. A brand new look and a brand new bride. Here, the film starts with a cop stealing evidence and bringing it to a stranger in a deserted location. There, he meets a grim demise. Soon, the audience finds out that his demise came at the hands of a beautiful, buxom blonde who really wanted the package he stole for her. She heads back home, and we soon discover her doll collection and her obsession with Charles Lee Ray, and in turn, with Chucky. She pieces our anti-hero doll back together, making some cosmetic changes in the process, giving him a new look with some fun changes. She makes him look a little more badass, if you ask me. Once he's all mended, she gets on with the ritual to bringing him back. It, however, doesn't work. What a crock. In comes her current plaything. Hey, Tiffany! A very 90s, gothified Alexis Araquette. After some time spent discussing life, death, and Chucky. Psst, no, he's he's even scary. Yes, he is. Look at they get down to business, and well, Chucky, the ever possessive boyfriend that he used to be, finally comes back and wrecks this poor soul. Here, truly starts our story. Chucky is back, baby. <laughs> the film is a bit of a mess. It has a ton going on, but for sure it is never boring. There's something going on in each and every scene. No wasted screen time anywhere. The film, if nothing else, is fun. It also brings Chucky into the almost 2000s, gives him a bride, thus adding to the whole world he lives in. It's a more than decent film for those who like the more comedic take on Chucky. Yes, the original is more scary than funny, but the evolution here works. The film, of course, didn't exactly hit right with the critics in 1998, and even fan reviews seem split right down the middle. A quick internet search seems to indicate that an even split between those who love the film and those who just cannot connect with it, critics and viewers alike. Overall, the film can be considered a mild hit. It had a budget of about 25 million US and made about double that at the box office with 50.7 US. As something that may have helped steer some viewers to it was its release date, right smack in the middle of October 1998, on the 16th to be exact. The film came in second place for its opening weekend with Practical Magic at number one, a film that appealed to a much wider, more general audience. The only other horror movie in the top 10 that week was Urban Legend, which was in its fourth week of release. The competition wasn't exactly fierce for horror fan money, so it did quite decent, opening with 11.8 million for the first weekend. Not bad at all considering its limited appeal outside of the horror community. Now, let's take a peek at why this movie is so much fun. 
The Talent. Written by Don Mancini like the first three films, the script clearly knows how to handle Chucky and what can be done with him without making it feel completely out of character. He added the humor and wrote the part of Tiffany with Jennifer Tilly in mind following her work in Bound, which was a bit of a challenge to get her at the time as she was a huge star. Yet she was so into it, she had to do it. The director selected for this go-around in Chucky Land was Ronnie Yu. Most horror fans know him as the man behind Freddy vs. Jason, which he doesn't have the best appreciation for. His previous work being so incredibly varied, he feels like a director who could handle anything. Before Bride of Chucky, Yu directed Legacy of Rage, which was Brandon Lee's cinematic debut, The Bride with White Hair, which is an interesting take on the legendary bride and a fun supernatural romance. And he had also directed Warriors of Virtue, which is either loved or hated or completely forgotten by most. But it's one film to watch first thing in the morning on a Saturday with a bowl of cereal. Yeah, his career was random before Bride of Chucky, and it remained so until his last film, Saving General Yang. In front of the camera, well, sort of, Brad Dorff comes back as Chucky's voice and seems to really be enjoying himself here being evil, cracking one-liners, playing his bride, the lovely Tiffany Valentine, in both human form and as the voice for the doll is the previously mentioned Jennifer Tilly, who is just so great here. She's having a blast and it shows. Side note, Tilly provided parts of her own wardrobe for the film due to her particular stunning figure and how she likes to look on screen. Playing the teens in danger, Jade and Jesse are Catherine Heigl and Nick Stabile, both fairly early in their careers. They make for decent human counterparts to Chucky and Tiffany. The parts have not necessarily aged super well, but they're still fun to watch. Also needing a mention are John Ritter and Alexis both getting fun deaths. The film is not just filled with doll mayhem. It has a ton of horror nods everywhere, sort of Easter eggs for the keen horror fan eye. For example, both Michael Myers's and Jason Voorhees' masks, Leatherface's chainsaw, and Freddy Krueger's glove are visible early on in the film, seemingly setting all these films in the same universe as Child's Play. An interesting opening to a shared universe if someone could have the funds to make something happen with all these maniacs. Of course, it could just be the collection of a horror fan. A bit later on, the police chief's attack with nails is a direct nod to Pinhead, which is not as clear, so it doesn't connect him as much to the same universe. Why does that look so familiar? In a more subtle nod to the Omen, Alexis Araquette's character is named Damien Baylock, after the child in the film and the evil nanny who watches over him. Another more tenuous reference is one to Leatherface, the Texas Chainsaw Massacre 3 with the use of the speak and spell. Spell one. Another less obvious one is Charlotte, the pet tarantula owned by Tiffany, who may be connected to Charlotte's web. Of course, these are external references and the film does some self-referential connects to the previous films, but those are quite obvious to fans of the franchise. All of the references to other films, characters, and previous Chucky entries are definitely fun, but they can also be a bit much for some viewers. As the most expensive entry in the Child's Play franchise, and the first one to deviate from the numbered titles, Bride of Chucky brings in a lot of humor, a lot of horror nods, and a lot of blood. The film here breathes new life into the franchise, and helped it get started again. It took seven years between Child's Play 3 and Bride of Chucky due to a low box office for the previous entry. However, the story of Child's Play 3 takes place in 1998, so Bride takes place only a month after the end of its predecessor. This way of doing things eventually became the norm with the franchise, having the films be done years apart, but taking place only a short time from each other. Bride of Chucky also brought in the humor that extends into the next few entries and the TV series. It also did something a bit unexpected in giving Tiffany a rather emotional scene when she talks to Chucky and realizes some truths she may not have been ready for before and tells him that they belong dead. This scene adds a bit of drama and an added layer of emotion to the characters. The Child's Play franchise is a bit of a roller coaster of styles and emotions as well as budgets and quality. But one thing is for sure, Chucky has been around on our screens since 1988. Like most horror franchises that skyrocketed in the 80s, Child's Play had plummeted by the mid-90s. 
But in 1996, Scream became a pivotal moment for the genre. Wes Craven's self-referential slasher helped revive mainstream interest in horror, and it gave birth to a new wave of slashers that featured characters with smarter dialogue who made less stupid decisions, for the most part, and delivered the all-important meta-humor. That wave included a bride mostly dressed in black leather. Bride of Chucky checked all the boxes of the updated slasher formula, especially when it came to the satire. In the opening scene of Bride, you can see Freddy's glove, Leatherface's chainsaw, along with Jason and Michael's mask, all in the same crime evidence lockers as the doll himself. The added dash of timely humor mixed with the stellar performances of series newcomer Jennifer Tilly and franchise vet Brad Dourif struck the right chord with audiences, becoming a solid financial success, earning a worldwide box office of $50.7 million against its $25 million budget. The new comedic element seemed to push the Killer Doll series in the right direction. And as most slasher icons do, Chucky returned in a new sequel. As outlandish and humorous as Bride of Chucky was, its successor, Seed of Chucky, went further off the rails and possibly off a cliff. But did it go too far? Find out as we look at what happened to Seed of Chucky. Before we continue with our video, here's a reminder to click the store tab on any of our Joe Blow channels and browse our collection of the latest and freshest designs in our merch store. Go get you some. Series creator Don Mancini began writing a follow-up to Bride of Chucky in the late 90s. It was originally titled Son of Chucky, and a draft was submitted to Universal Studios in 1998. Mancini penned the journey of Chucky's son to mirror his own struggles with coming out as gay. But the title of the movie would change to Seed of Chucky, as it wouldn't exactly introduce a son, but a young doll who would struggle with gender dysphoria, as a nod to 1953's Glenn or Glenda, with Mancini even using the titular names for the character and its alter ego. Directed by the infamously eccentric Ed Wood, the 1953 docudrama also starred Mr. Wood as the protagonist, cross-dressing when playing the role of Glenda. Unsurprisingly, Mancini's script was rejected as the studio expected a more traditional slasher film. Instead, Focus Films, a division of Universal, agreed to finance the project in 2003 after their latest project, Eli Roth's Cabin Fever, was a success. With Roth joking that, for those who saw Cabin Fever and hated it, should know that their dollars ultimately went to a good cause. Mancini had also written a more true-to-form script that ultimately never got made. Entitled Chucky Goes Psycho, it would once again feature his bride, but this time she'd be killed outside the infamous Bates Motel by a group of teenagers recklessly driving and hitting Tiffany. This would inevitably lead Chucky to go after them seeking revenge, a nod to I Know What You Did Last Summer. Clearly, the sequel was always meant to continue the recently added meta approach. In one of the early scenes of Seed of Chucky, there's a sequence with a man dressed as Santa who's killed in the snow by Chucky and Tiffany. It's revealed to be a movie set with the camera eventually exposing the film crew and equipment. The movie they're shooting is Chucky Goes Psycho. The man dressed as Santa is actor Jason Fleming, who has since stated that Seed of Chucky is the only film that he regrets doing, saying he was dressed as Santa getting killed by a doll on a set in Romania and wondering where did it go wrong? Character actor Joe Pantoliano was considered for the role that would eventually go to rapper Redman. Another actor considered for that role was Quentin Tarantino, who unfortunately turned it down, though the role was actually written with Quentin in mind. The part of Pete Peters, the snooping sleazebag reporter, was written specifically for filmmaker and actor John Waters, as he was a fan of the Child's Play franchise. He would later return in the season 3 finale of the Chucky TV series as Wendell Wilkins, the original creator of The Good Guy Doll. Bringing the role of Jennifer Tilly to life is actress Jennifer Tilly, who pulls a double stint as the voice of Tiffany, Chucky's wife and killing companion. Brad Dourif returns to voice the pint-sized predator Chucky, then playing the role of Jennifer Tilly's assistant Joan is singer and actress Hannah Spirit, who has the honor of best death in the movie. 
playing himself as rapper-turned-actor Redman, who plays a rapper-turned-director. Actor Steve West betrays Stan, Jennifer's limo driver, who spends the duration of the film trying to tell Jennifer that he loves her, but constantly finds himself interrupted. Puppeteer Tony Gardner has a cameo as himself early on, and might just be the runner-up for best death. The titular Seed, and son slash daughter Glenn and Glenda, is played by musician and Lord of the Rings actor Billy Boyd. Glenn's look and personality is based on a character Tim Burton might create, like Edward Scissorhands, according to Don Mancini. Mancini wanted to give Glenn his own signature look, while a producer felt that he should resemble his father. Glenn does possess blue eyes, red hair, and freckles. However, his hair and eyes are a different shade than Chucky's. Glenda's personality, and the fact that the doll does the killing only while dressed in female clothing, is inspired by Brian De Palma's film Dress to Kill. Composer Pino DiNaggio, who frequently collaborated with De Palma and scored Dress to Kill, also composed the score for Seed of Chucky. He also worked on several horror films, including Piranha, The Howling, Tourist Trap, and another De Palma classic, Carrie. Glenn slash Glenda's journey begins as a recurring nightmare where he kills the parents of a little girl who owns him as a toy. Don Mancini originally wrote this scene with the characters of Jesse and Jade from the previous film as Glenn's victims. Glenn wakes up to a berating ventriloquist with whom he puts on a show in London. Seeing his parents on TV prompts Glenn to board a truck headed to Hollywood. He's shipped to the set of Chucky Goes Psycho, and he woefully reads the voodoo chant on Chucky's Heart of Dumbala amulet, inadvertently bringing the dolls back to life. Soon enough, Chucky and Tiffany are back to killing before Glenn's eyes, which horrifies him. Or her. The new parents check under Glenn's pants to find no discernible reproductive organs. Tiffany wants a daughter and calls the doll Glenda. Chucky wants a son and refers to him as Glenn. Chucky also wants his son to join the family business of viciously murdering people. This scares Glenn and he hopes his parents can change their murderous ways. Tiffany tries a 12-step program, which has her calling people to make amends, including the wife of the police officer that she killed in the previous installment. Tiffany thinks of killing as an addiction that she can beat. Meanwhile, Glenn takes after his father in regards to killing, but only if he can dress up as Glenda, who looks like a cross between Tiffany and Greta, the gremlin seductress from Gremlins 2. Meanwhile, Jennifer Tilly is desperately trying to revive her career and believes that she can make a comeback by starring in Redman's upcoming film, The Virgin Mary. The ever-conventional murderous Tiffany disapproves of Jennifer using her body to advance her career. While Chucky wants to take over Redman's body, they plan to ambush the pair to possess their bodies and impregnate Jennifer with Chucky's seed and live as a family of humans. Turns out Redman is no longer available to possess after Tiffany has what she calls a slip, deviating from her 12-step program by killing him. So they find a replacement in Stan, Jennifer's limo driver. By the way, in case you're wondering, none of these plans or plot points were a joke. This is what really happened on screen. Seed of Chucky opened in mid-November of 2004, earning $8.7 million on its first weekend. Oddly enough, they just barely missed the Halloween window, though releases like Saw and The Grudge premiered that October and garnered impressive box office results. During its theatrical run, the film grossed an estimated $17.1 million domestically, and added an additional $7.7 .7 million in other territories, for a worldwide total of nearly $25 million. Despite earning nearly double its budget costs, Seed of Chucky's box office performance was seen as somewhat underwhelming. Also underwhelming were critics' reviews, which were mixed to negative, earning a 34% approval rating on Rotten Tomatoes. The general consensus on the site reads, Give Seed of Chucky credit for embracing the increasing absurdity of the franchise, even if the end results really aren't all that funny or entertaining. The audience approval score is at a measly 43% based on over 100,000 ratings. Roger Ebert gave the film 2 out of 4 stars and remarked that Seed of Chucky is actually two movies, one wretched, the other funny, favoring the scenes with Jennifer Tilly. On Metacritic, the film holds a 46 out of 100, based on 17 critic reviews, and an audience score of 3.6 out of 10 based on over 100 ratings. 
On IMDb, users gave it an average 4.9 out of 10. Amongst critics and fans, Seed of Chucky is often ranked as the worst of the Child's Play franchise. With the combination of its notoriety and its upcoming 20-year anniversary, perhaps a reevaluation will earn the film some new fans. Its bad word of mouth could make it come off better than what it's made out to be. Another bright spot is the performance of Jennifer Tilly. Tilly showcases great range, from living a glamorous yet hectic Hollywood life, to dealing with industry sleazebags, and not to mention reacting to the insanity of living dolls, running and screaming at the top of her lungs. She also takes on the task of talking so badly about herself via Tiffany, who calls her fat and a slut, insults that would land Tiffany in hot water in 2024. The film also features a significant point in the series that comes just a moment before Tiffany and Chucky are about to carry out their twisted plan. Chucky gives up on the attempt to switch bodies altogether, saying, I have had it! That's it! There is a limit to how much I can take! I'm one of the most notorious slashers in history. I am Chucky, the killer doll, and I dig it! For the sequel that followed, the studio wanted a spin-off movie that featured a darker tone, with Glenn as the main antagonist and a new slasher villain. Don Mancini agreed only to reintroducing the darker tone, but scrapped the idea of Glenn and brought back the original good guy doll as the film's central villain. In fact, Glenn and Glenda are weirdly absent in the sequels Curse of Chucky and Cult of Chucky with Don Mancini stating that they were originally referenced in the script for Cold, however, most of the references were removed. They do, however, appear in the Chucky TV series, thanks to a variety of chaotic storylines. After writing every script of the Child's Play films, Seed of Chucky became Don Mancini's directorial debut. Mancini as the director became a new staple for the franchise, as he would subsequently direct each Child's Play film from that point on save for the 2019 reboot, and even direct several episodes of Chucky. In the grand scheme of things, Seed of Chucky introduced us to Glenn and Glenda. Love them or hate them, or maybe you're just plain indifferent towards them. They've been a bit inconsequential and superfluous throughout the years, but some fans still wonder if and when they'll reappear, which makes them unpredictable and even exciting. They may never be the central story again, but they'll most likely return in some outrageous fashion. In any case, between Seed of Chucky and Don't Breathe, I can confidently say that I have absolutely no interest in ever using a turkey baster.